Giddy Stein had what he calls a normal childhood, although he did grow up in Jerusalem with biblical olive trees in his backyard, and he spent eight years in the IDF working on advanced science and technology projects. That was enough to prepare him to lead a couple of high-tech, low-success startup companies before settling into life as a practicing physician and earning his PhD in microbiology. He never expected to get back into the startup scene, but then the tragic death of a nine-year-old as a result of a medication error led him to co-found Metaware to develop AI-based next-generation technology for online monitoring and prevention of medication-related risks at the point of care and beyond. Metaware is deployed in provider settings where it dramatically cuts down fatigue from irrelevant alerts and identifies the truly important problems. The number of alerts is reduced to only a handful per department per day, but these are the ones prescribers actually pay attention to. The company is striving to make its solutions ubiquitous by partnering with OEMs such as Baxter, where they've demonstrated dramatic success with the company's smart infusion pumps. I'm David Williams, host of the Health Biz Podcast and president of Health Business Group, a strategy consulting firm that helps companies like Metaware develop robust growth plans and get introduced to the right partners. Reach out to me, dwilliams at healthbusinessgroup.com, if you'd like to discuss strategy for your company. While you're at it, please subscribe to the Health Biz Podcast on your favorite service. Well, Dr. Giddy Stein, co-founder and CEO at Metaware, welcome to the Health Biz Podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me. You know, I'm well aware of Metaware. I think a lot of people are. Uh, so we'll get to that in a few minutes, but I first wanted to spend some time on how you got there and starting way back at the beginning, if you don't mind, uh, and talk a little bit about your background. What was your upbringing like? What was your childhood like? Basically normal childhood. I was born and raised in uh, Jerusalem, uh, which is an interesting uh, place to grow up in, especially the 1970s where I grew up. Uh, basically, my my backyard was where the olive trees that you know that were created for the cross uh, uh, were actually raised. So walking among them gives you some kind of perspective of history. Um, and you know, pretty normal childhood in Israel. Everyone goes to the army at the age of eighteen. Been there for a few years, and you know, then moved on. Yeah. What was your uh, what was your role in the military? So I, I was a I was a captain in the in the Israeli uh, Israeli army. Um, I was I was there for almost eight years, and I led a group of uh, of scientists and uh, R and D experts and algorithm experts to develop all kinds of cool operational systems. Um, which was great fun. A lot of responsibility for an 18, 19 year old. Yeah. Uh, you don't see that very often. Exactly. But it was great fun. You know, when you talk about a normal upbringing and then you mention the olive trees and then, you know, 18, my, my 18 year old, I think his main job is to figure out which bathing suit he wants to, you know, put on in the summertime. So uh, that's good to have a little bit more responsibility. It certainly uh, shapes you where you go. Now, in, on the educational side, you, you focused on uh, medicine and engineering. What was the impetus for that? Well, when I joined the Army, I had the opportunity to study in the university in parallel to my, to my activities. So I studied math and computer science. I was, uh, that was you know, my main uh, occupation uh, in the Army. And when I left the Army, I was a VP R&D, CTO of uh, several failing startups in the early 90s. And, you know, I was mainly focused on, on, on tech, algorithms, etc. But uh, after, you know, a few failing startups and looked back and thought, well, maybe software engineering and, you know, the whole running around after money is not my main thing and I don't like startups anyway, so let's find something that has a meaning and something that, you know, long-term experience has some kind of value. So I ended up in medicine. I was the oldest medical student in Tel Aviv University at the time, already nice. with family and kids. So quite an experience. 
Now, when you were talking about these failing startups, I saw a couple that were on your LinkedIn profile, one called iImpact and one CytoView, where those are a couple of the examples. And, you know, before we gloss yeah. over them too, too quickly and get on to more recent successes, people say you learn a lot from, you know, failures, if those in fact were failures. Did you, did you have that experience either at the time or looking back? You know, what was it? What was the impact of having, having done those other than saying, hey, you want to do something, uh, you know, focusing on, on helping people by practicing medicine? Well, you know, so I probably had a lot to learn from. <laughs> These were really uh, two distinct failures. So the first startup called uh, iImpact uh, was at the verge of e-commerce. You know, e-commerce was just getting off. You know, eBay didn't even exist at the time. You know, everything was just in the raw stages. And we saw that there were these new websites generated a lot of logs, huge log files. And we thought, we, we, you know, we can take these log files and make some kind of business savvy out of them and understand, you know, what kind, what works, what doesn't work, where are we losing money, where are the sites gaining money. So basically, we, we thought we invented BI, even though there wasn't that theme yet, but there weren't any customers at the time. And we, you know, developed something way too big for for the size and scale of the market that day. You know, if we would have been five years later, it probably would have been much better success. But at the time, you know, it just didn't work out. And Site of You was another interesting thing because um, at that time, there were new technologies that enabled high throughput molecular imaging uh, that was in the beginning only at the universities, but later was the fundamentals of, of, of many uh, bioengineering and, 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 and biopharma uh, uh, applications. But at that time, again, a very, very new technology. So we created a platform that knew how to gather and analyze and, 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 and run all kinds of different methodologies on hundreds of thousands of images, multispectral at once, and just click of a button, you get the result. And, the result, and, you know, when we went to the labs, they said, well, you know, the cheapest thing we have is PhDs, so anything that I have to pay for is much more, is much more than we pay the PhDs, so, yeah, maybe next time. And only a few years later, when it became apparent that you can't really write a paper on two, or research on two images, one red and one green, you actually need thousands and thousands to, to make a statistical impact, but by then we were closed. So, again, too early for the market. So maybe you should have stayed in the army for twelve years instead of eight years, and you would have come out and hit all these these trends just as they were emerging at the right time. Well, you know, you have to know when to get into the army, when to get out of the army. So, fair enough. So let's talk about not the career me for me. Let's talk about Metaware that you've been focusing on for some time now. What is the founding story behind Metaware? I know you're a co-founder of it, but like, where what was the impetus to bring it into being? So after I was the oldest medical student in Tel Aviv University, I, I graduated. I specialized in internal medicine. I was uh, had executive roles in one of Israel's leading hospitals. You know, teaching resident I was a professor of medicine in Tel Aviv University, where I teach clinical medicine. I also did a PhD in computational biology. You know, really went on a limb on the research side, on the clinical side. You know, life was good. I never thought I would go back to. To, to the actual, you know, uh, startup world. But then I was encountered purely by chance with a case, a tragic case of a nine-year-old boy that died simply because his primary care physician clicked on the wrong entry in the Pulda menu list of the medication list and gave him the wrong drug by mistake. And, and when you think about this tragedy, you know, on one hand, it wasn't bad judgment on part of that physician. It was a typo. Yeah. And one would have thought it would be some kind of a cool spell checkers to prevent these typos from happening, but, but apparently, you know, this is not this wasn't the case. And when you look at the process from thirty thousand feet, from the moment the clinician just clicked on the wrong button by mistake until the boy actually received the med, there were so many places down the line, stations in which all the relevant information was available to the different decision makers to just look at them and see that this is just the wrong drug for the wrong patient at the physician, at the EMR, at the pharmacy, at the insurance company, even the mother just look at the label. And the fact that this actually slipped through the cracks 
meant that although it was maybe initiated by a failure of an individual, but it really represented a failure of system, a systematic failure. And a systematic failure really necessitates a systematic solution. And we thought we could do that. Makes sense. You know, when I remember when um, in the olden days, there was the problem of the you know, physician handwriting. You always make fun of that. They wrote on the prescription and the pharmacist would have trouble interpreting it. But on the other hand, the pharmacist was, they were looking at it and they knew something might be wrong. And, you know, there wasn't a great system, but you would call and check it out if something was wrong. And there would occasionally be an error. And one of the ideas of the electronic medical record, hey, we won't have that. You'll be able to read it. Well, you can read it and it looks official, but it could be, you know, the chances are the, you wouldn't have had that type of typo error the primary care physician probably didn't prescribe that medication normally. They wouldn't have written that. That wouldn't have been one of the things that it looked like they had written out. So it's a new type of error, you know, that could be introduced. And then it looks very official because it's coming out of the computer. You're, you're absolutely right. And, and what we see is accumulation of two phenomena that together can really lead to, to disaster. One is, as you said, the fact that the way that we prescribe is different. And there were many promises around electronic prescribing and reducing medication-related errors. While this is true, there were new emerging types of errors that there were no guidelines how to deal with, no safeguards to, to, to guard against them that suddenly emerged. So, you know, w one of the biggest safeguards that, that, that we had in the, when we wrote manual prescri prescription is that even though my handwriting was terrible, maybe I missed something, I wrote the name of the medication I wanted and the dosage, and I gave the prescription by hand to my patient. So there was no way that I could hand the, the prescription to the wrong patient by mistake. But today I can sit in my office, the nurse could come in and say, hey, don't forget to give insulin to Joe. And I gave it by mistake to Joseph because his file was opened and not to Joe, and a simple typo mistake that in handwritten prescription just didn't occur. <coughs> and, and there's a whole, because of the terrible handwriting of physicians, there's a whole guidelines that say, you know, what is sound alike, what is look alike, you know, two medications look alike, sound alike, the pharmacist has to be aware. But now the definition of look alike is new because it, the two names don't look at all similar but only the three first letters are the same. So in the pull down menu, when you type in the name, suddenly, you know, the, the whole concept of what it sounded like, look alike, completely changes. So that's a new, and, and there's no, you know, no guidelines, no safeguards that currently, that to, to protect the patients from this. Now take that with, the, with what's happening today in hospitals and community, when I was a resident, you know, a good doctor knew about 50 medications. A patient may have two or three medications when he comes into the hospital, maybe two lab tests. And I accept maybe received five to seven, eight patients a night in my department. It was manageable. I knew everyone by heart. Today, my resident received between 15 and 20 patients every night, each of them with 20 medications out of thousands. They have no idea what these medications are. A, a, an EMR record of hundreds of pages that they have to review just to know what the patient has. And it's almost impossible, you know, not to make a mistake. Add to that the pharmacy, in which when I was a boy, the, the mom and shop pop pharmacy knew me, knew my parents, knew what we were taking, there was the best safeguard. Say, oh, this is not for you. This doc, you know, he's an idiot. He gave you the wrong drug. But today you go to a CVS or Walgreens, fresh out of college kid, never saw you in your life, has no idea who you are, what you're taking. How can he be that safeguard? So right now we're in this environment where, you know, everything can go wrong and probably we will. So, you know, you started off with the example of how the company was founded with this tragic case of the nine-year-old boy, which was just obviously an anecdote. Nonetheless, it's one that I think people could relate to. You could see how it could happen. And then you're describing what's occurred in terms of just the multiplication of the complexity and the velocity uh, of, of all these that are happening. Any idea 
about just how big this problem is? Is there a way to get your arms around it other than to see, yeah, this is serious, we need to, to look at it? So there are numbers, you know, out there in research, talk about billions and billions of dollars of, of adverse drug events, prevented, uh, preventable cost of, uh, uh, of readmission, et cetera, et cetera. But what we actually see in real life, in our customers, is that for every known error, we found between 20 and 100 more that were just unrecognized, including case fatalities, in which patient died, but nobody knew that it was because of a mistake that happened three days earlier. And we're able to wrap this up and, and, and comprehend it. Now, it is really, you know, if you think about the, the clinician, it's almost inconceivable that they will be able to pick every day the needle in the haystack and uh, define all the risks when they are overworked, now with COVID, doing jobs that they're not you know, well-equipped or, or used to do, doing multiple shifts, and basically, you know, really exhausted. You don't let people drive like that, but they, you let them take care of your mother. So that's really... So you've laid out the problem quite uh, clearly, and I think implied some of the solutions, and by your background, I can, I can guess at some of them. What is it that MetaWare does, and how do you measure the impact that you have? What we do is, is first the state of mind of clinicians usually talking as, as a clinician it says, we don't make mistakes. You know, it may happen sometimes, but usually we don't make mistakes. We, we are the best doctors in the world. My notion is that you can still be the best doctor in the world, but still have typos. Like I can be the best poet in the world and still have typos and eat the spell checker in my word processor. I can be the best doctor and still have typos in my medications or my, you know, miss some lab tests or things like that. It doesn't make me less of a doctor, it just makes me human. And when we assume that there will be an error and we're actively looking for it, for some kind of risk, then we will find it. And how do we find it? By crunching millions of, of records and understanding the normal behavior patterns of clinicians, how they prescribe, what they prescribe, to who they prescribe, and then we're able to identify outlier situation. Now, we don't know if they're right or wrong. We just say, hey, this is out of the norm. Are you sure you want to do that? Maybe you meant something else. And by doing so, not only at the moment of prescribing, but continuously monitor the patient throughout the continuum of care for new lab tests, vital signs, any change in their profile that may render one of the medications suddenly dangerous, we're able to catch many, many types of, of risk that are currently uncovered by current solutions. And moreover, because we really cherry pick the, our interventions, we intervene maybe once, twice a day in a department, three times, not more than that. And by doing so, we get the attention of the clinician. So they don't ignore our intervention, they don't ignore our alert, and they actually pay attention to it. And we have data to show that most of our interventions cause a change in clinician practice, meaning that not only they read it, not only they agreed with it, but they actually changed the prescription, stopped it, modified it per our recommendations. So, uh, and we have published quite a few on this matter. So let me just unpack that a little bit, because I know when I go to the pharmacy and I have something prescribed, you know, usually there's all these warnings that come up and the pharmacist says, you know, this, 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 and they have like a whole bunch of warnings. So it's not as though there weren't warnings and then nobody's paying attention and looking for errors. But if I understand correctly, first of all, a lot of that is just pure noise that you'd see has got really nothing to do with me. And then there's a whole bunch of other things going on that even despite all those things are, are not kept up. There's also a temporal element in that maybe it's not an issue for me right now, but maybe if my lab test a week from now is different, then it's going to be a problem and the pharmacist is long gone uh, at that point. And then there's just the kind of the human piece about, you know, amidst all this noise and with all the patients and all the complexity that uh, providers have to deal with, how do you actually reduce the number of things that you're telling them about and make sure that those are actually important? And if you do, then they'll pay attention. Have I, have I understood that right? Right. And, and the way to do that is really reflecting back on that institutions or multiple institutions data to see how they practice. Because... We're not there to teach clinicians how to practice. 
We just say, you know, what you're doing is out of the norm for your organization, for your standard of care. So let's say if a classic alert of an inter drug interaction or dosage pops up, you know, every five minutes in an organization, that means that this is how they practice. Now, if this is how they practice, the fact that I'm nudging them with a recurrent alert won't change that. So maybe I just wouldn't show that. I would maybe discuss it once with a pharmacist. But apart from that, if this is how you practice, this is how you practice. There's no way of, of, of reducing that just by nudging. So we just remove that. So once we are able to remove the noise by more than 80, 90%, suddenly we get you know, some quiet. Once there's quiet in the system, people start listening. And then we can add more layers of safety that are currently really unaddressed. So as you said, most of the uh, systems out there today, drug interaction databases, the dosage checkers, allergies, mainly focus at the prescribing or dispensing event. But we know that more than 60, 70% of the risk associated with medications happen when the patient's already home or already in the department way after he's already taking this med for a day, two, three, or four weeks. And we need to be able to monitor the changes, labs, vitals, to see if there's an evolving adverse drug event, or if in 99% of the cases, a lab test is obtained you know, two weeks after a medication of some sort is given, and it doesn't, then we would provide an alert to the physician, hey, you know, you, you may want to order this lab test because in most cases, that's what happens when, when you prescribe this medication or combination of medications. And, and by doing so, we are remaining very, very prudent in providing actionable alerts, something that the physician or pharmacist, mostly pharmacists, need to act upon now, not something in the future because he won't see the patient in the future. He needs to act on that now. So this timely intervention is critical for the compliance. When I think about the standard tools that are out there, like these drug-drug interactions and so on, that's a very much a sort of a rules-based thing that you can, you can feed in. When you're describing about how just looking for something that's out of the ordinary for the practice pattern, that sounds more like an MI or, or a machine learning or an artificial intelligence sort of approach. What are the sort of things that you deploy? Is it all sort of in black box, AI, ML? Are there rules-based elements to it? Help me understand, like, what's actually involved in, in solving this problem? So it's a combination of several things. So let, let's start with you know, reducing the noise from the current alert. So the current alerts are originating from, from commonly used commercial drug databases. You know, there are many companies that, that have it. And, and the common theme in, in these databases is indeed that the alerts are not personalized. And because they're not personalized, there are a lot of them and most of them are ignored and are not clinically relevant for that patient at that time. It may be right in general, but not personally for that patient. And by combining these knowledge bases with a, a large data from the customer, we're able to match these rules with a common practice in the organization and provide the pharmacist leadership with a very sophisticated analysis. Say, guys, you know, these are the top ranking interventions that you know cause most of the noise and here is how we propose you personalize them and we're not saying remove them but say let's adjust them to the patient let me give you an example so let's say two drugs aspirin clopidogrel all of, both of them are anti aggregants or blood diluters there's a fixed interaction that says you know they might increase the risk of bleeding but Every patient that had a myocardial infarction or had a stent paste or, or acute coronary syndrome, it's mandatory per guidance for him to take this medication. But if we remove this rule altogether from the library, then if we have an you know, elderly patient that is taking these two meds by mistake, bleeding from an ulcer in a geriatric department, he could be saved if the alert would have flagged. So what we do is say, okay, let's identify in this organization who are the patients who are likely to receive these two meds together, post-MI in the recent year, whatever that is. We'll use our algorithms to identify that. And let's exclude them from this specific rule and apply the rule only to the ones who are not fitting this criteria, i.e. elderly patient, peptic ulcer, no MI, no coronary something in the last two years, et cetera. 
And again, by doing so, we're able to reduce the number of alerts and, 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 and reduce the noise. Once we've done that, then we can use, on top of that, our pure AI-based uh, engine, black box or, or, or variants of it, to provide more types of insights that are mostly AI-driven, wrong drug to the wrong patient, you know, laboratory trends that indicate something is happening, all kinds of stuff that is currently not part of any other decision support tool, that per our understanding of the patient context and our algorithm, we're able to provide that extra layer of safety to protect the patients from these errors that are EMR-oriented, that didn't exist in the manual prescribing, but now do. Does that make sense? It sure does. Yeah, yeah. So to talk about how it's deployed practically. It sounds like you know, it's actually live system. Uh, where is it? And then how does it fit in? Is it one more thing on top of the EMR, e-prescribing, and so on? Or how does it fit into the workflow? So it's basically an engine that can uh, reside inside the firewall of the healthcare organization or on the cloud. Um, uh, it doesn't have a UI. I mean, the... the Physicians don't know we are there. We are communicating with electronic medical record system in the background and analyzing the data in real time and sending the interventions to the, the pharmacist, to the clinicians, to the nurse through the user interface and the workflows of the EMR. And so we are living in the background. But we are not only limited to working with electronic medical records, but we also recently started working with medical device companies. So you know, just a month ago, uh, we published a very interesting and, and, and strategic relationship with Baxter Healthcare, in which our system is embedded in the control tower of smart infusion pumps. Uh, and, and by reducing the, the number of alerts and creating new types of, uh, of high, very sophisticated, very accurate alert uh, at the pump, uh, we are able to provide value to the customers. And, and the results of that study were recently published in, in the big conference in, in December, and a big press release came out of the paper. Great. So that sounds like a, a global approach. And then are there... Would this be used differently in hospitals in different parts of the world? I know it is different, maybe different electronic medical records used in different places, different styles of practice, um, different drugs. Is it a universally applicable uh, approach, and is it, is it deployed in multiple places? Yes. So the way that our system works is that we create in our servers a parallel universe to the EMR, and create a very compact, normalized, clean, global, if you will, a, a globally standard a longitudinal patient record, continuously updated all the time. And we translate the lab tests, the med med medication names, the auto administration, all of that into and diagnosis into standard, ATC coding, loings, all, all the relevant things. And by doing so, we're able to even compare models that were created in one hospital in Israel and tested in another hospital in the U.S. and applied in China somewhere, because eventually it's very, very similar. Now, obviously, the models are adaptive to the specific local practices of the hospital, but the models themselves, the, the base, is, is the same. And this really helps us, regardless of which EMR or, or geography that we are in, to really create a, a global impact uh, based on, on our technology. Where would you expect uh, the next few years to, to lead? I know you've been focused a lot in the hospital systems, and now with this major agreement with Baxter, you're embedding uh, you know, in, in, in others' hardware. Where, where do you expect to go over the next while? And, uh, as you said, you know, we started working with healthcare organizations, and, and we are now following the Baxter deal and really understanding that you know, our biggest value uh, is, is that smart engine that, that makes, you know, we make your data smarter. We, make, we, we provide you with a competitive edge, you, i.e., 
no other medical device company, decision support companies, EMR vendors, that so we can really be that edge, that competitive edge uh, uh, on their platform. And that is why we're more focused on OEM type of opportunities, partnering with the large players, in that domain, everything that circles around the medication delivery space, inpatients, outpatients, insurance companies, malpractice insurance companies, and even pharma uh, at the end of the road. I look forward to us being plugged everywhere. Great. Protecting oh, everyone like ever, everywhere. It'll be, a good, uh, it'll be good for patients and the clinicians when that happens uh, as well. So I wish you the very best on that. Giddy, let me ask you a final question, uh, which is about, you know, in the midst of uh, all that you do with the company and at the hospital and so on, do you have any time for reading and are there any books that you would recommend to our listeners and viewers? Uh, so I, I do enjoy reading. I don't have a lot of time for that, unfortunately, but actually the only place I can really read in quiet is the bathroom, so I have dedicated time for that. But even then, you know, my kids bang on the door sometimes. Yeah, um, I I don't have anything smart to recommend. Usually, I read kind of trashy novels, uh, you know, all kinds of detective story, Harlan Coben, etc. Because yeah. you know, I just take them, read them in a few minutes, you know, an hour or two, and that's it. Uh, I also read them sometimes on the plane, but no, nothing too fancy to recommend, unfortunately. Fair time. enough. I actually had somebody recommend. Uh, the book uh, Lincoln's Lawyer, which was like a really, he, it was almost sheepish about it because it's sort of an easy read and, and all that. But I, I read it. I really enjoyed it, actually. So uh, no, no shame in these, uh, in these short uh, detective stories that could be, could be pretty good. Well, Giddy Stein, co-founder and CEO of Metaware, I want to say thank you very much for sharing your story today on the Health Biz Podcast. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.
You've been listening to the Health Biz Podcast with me, David Williams, president of Health Business Group. I conduct in-depth interviews with leaders in healthcare business and policy. If you like what you hear, go ahead and subscribe on your favorite service. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe on your second and third favorite services as well. There's more good stuff to come, and you won't want to miss an episode. If your organization is seeking strategy consulting services in healthcare, check out our website, healthbusinessgroup.com.